for that um, unnecessary lengthy introduction. Um, and thanks to Julia for organising this today. I don't get the chance to speak to the public that often, but when I do, I'm always reminded of what a privilege it is to do this work here at the Garvin. Um, what I hope to show you is we, we've got quite a high degree of innovation with this work, and none of that's uh, possible without uh, support of the public. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about exercise. It's been touched on by some of the other speakers already, something that uh, everyone's pretty familiar with. Everyone, some people might have even exercised already today. Um, but that said, the familiarity, despite that familiarity, there's still a lot we don't know about the effects of exercise on, on health. So the simplest, sorry, just before I, I mention that, um, this program called the Health Report on ABC Radio, um, I, I don't know why I put this picture of it, it's a, it's a radio show, but um, I was on there on Monday talking about this research. Uh, you can still listen to it if you like. You can, if you're really keen, you can listen to it right now because it's been uh, uh, repeated live on the radio, but uh, you're probably better off uh, listening to what I've got to say now. So the first message I can give you is the simplest, and it's something you already know, I'm sure. Um, the, the effect of exercise um, and inactivity uh, are opposite on disease risk. And we've touched on it before today. If you compare or if you um, combine inactivity with excess calorific intake, you get this uh, unwanted uh, buildup of abdominal fat, what we call uh, visceral adiposity. And that in itself is associated with an increased risk of things like type 2 diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease. If you look at the opposite uh, condition, if you do lots of exercise, Obviously, exercise burns a lot more calories. It's one way in which you can prevent this uh, abdominal fat, and that's associated with an, a reduced risk of uh, these conditions. So, quite simply, exercise burns calories. It's a great way in you can, which you can try and avoid this uh, excess fat buildup. Just to uh, give you uh, an example of that, if we look at different populations and their activity or their energy requirements, Non-exercises, it depends on your size, but you're looking at about a, a calorific requirement of about 2,000 calories a day. If you like to do a bit of running, uh, do the occasional marathon, your, your requirements are slightly higher. Um, if you're a Tour de France cyclist, um, if you're unfamiliar, this is a, a cycle race in Europe where everyone cheats. Um, <laughs> but cheating aside, they have a, a huge uh, requirement for energy. So to put that into perspective, there are close to 8,000 calories a day. Um, that's around about 29 cheeseburgers um, from a, a disreputable uh, fast food outlet. So if you can imagine, if you can eat over 20 cheeseburgers a, in a day and not gain weight, that kind of demonstrates how powerful vigorous exercise is at burning calories. So that's one way in which we can combat this uh, unwanted progression of uh, we are coming, becoming bigger uh, as, as we get older uh, while our TVs are seemingly getting much thinner. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're not related. So again, simplest thing I can, t uh, uh, can send you away with. Uh, exercise is a great way in which you can uh, maintain this, this energy balance and, and uh, avoid that buildup of, of abdominal fat. And in fact, you can get lots of uh, these wearables these days, which will give you some estimation of your calorific uh, expenditure. And it might make it a little bit easier for you to, to, to make this uh, balance uh, a bit more effective. That's the simple stuff, okay? However, there are effects of exercise that work completely independently of energy balance. And that's what we're really interested in here at the Garvin. Um, believe it or not, this is me. Um, oh my goodness, 20 years ago. Um, and what I'm doing is a, a maximal uh, oxygen uptake test. Um, I, I used to uh, compete as an athlete, not very uh, successfully, but I used to train every day. And what I'm doing here is uh, measuring my maximal oxygen uptake because it was a way in which I could try and optimize my training a bit better. However, that's been used uh, in a, 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 I guess a public health setting. This is a classic study where they followed 10,000 people and every single one of them, they carried out this maximal uh, treadmill exercise test. 
And what it gives you is effectively a score of exercise capacity. And then when you follow those people throughout their lifespan, you can see that your ability to do exercise, your score in this test, has quite a big bearing on your age-adjusted mortality, quite simply, your risk of dying. So you can see that if you, the fitter you are, the lower your age-adjusted mortality or the risk of dying. And just to give you a, a, an idea, so my VO2 max here when I was a young man was about 70 mils per kilogram uh, of body weight. You can see that if you're very unfit, around about 20, you can see a small increase in your, in your uh, exercise capacity reduces your risk of dying quite, by quite a lot. And that still holds true uh, irrespective of other disease or, um, or risk factors. So whether you're, you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood glucose, whether you're a smoker, whether you have a high body mass index or a, a family history of death, if you score higher on the exercise capacity test, if you are effectively a fitter individual, you have a, a much reduced risk of death. So what we ask here at the Garvin is, what is it about exercise? It's not, clearly not just energy balance. What is it about exercise that makes us have such a benefit on health? Now, for some time we've been working with this concept that a lot of these benefits of exercise might be mediated by circulating factors. So, for example, throughout the literature there is uh, examples of uh, proteins that are released into circulation with exercise. So proteins can be released from the brain, from uh, the liver, and even bone can release proteins into the circulation with exercise. And indeed our esteemed chair today and uh, my boss, I should, I should speak uh, highly of him because he is my boss, um, he coined the term uh, myokine. And that's something that we've been work, working on a while. I'm a group leader of the myokine biology group here at the Garvin. And a myokine is, uh, so the term myo indicates muscle and the kind in, indicates a signal. And it's a, a protein that's released from muscle uh, in order to carry out some sort of endocrine uh, function somewhere else. And what we've been trying to do for the last nine years or so is trying to identify myokines and try and figure out if it's these proteins in this interchange of information that might mediate some of the benefits of exercise. So a really quick biology lesson for you all. Um, you're probably familiar with your, that you have a genome, your DNA. Um, the DNA of your, of your body is what is possible. So the DNA of your cell is what is possible. That translates into protein with a, a message in the, in the, in the middle lap there. So if you measure mRNA, that's what your cell wants to do. But ultimately, it's the proteins that make things happen in your cell. So um, the Garvin has got a, um, a justifiably fantastic um, reputation for the measurement of the genome and the transcriptome. What we've done here uh, is put a bit more emphasis on the protein because it's ultimately the, the protein that, that is doing the work and it's effectively what is doing, um, doing those functions of the cell. And we do so using uh, a really fantastic instrument called a mass spectrometer. These are about a million dollars uh, each to buy, but they give you an incredible amount of information. So this is an example of an early study we did uh, when, when I arrived in Australia. So we took uh, some mice. This is a mouse uh, in the same way that I was on a tre treadmill 20 years ago. This one's on a treadmill these days. And we isolated the muscles and we analyzed them using a mass spectrometer. And what that gives you is a really long list of proteins that change within the muscle. Okay, so when we look at that, we see there's an exercise effect, and we again, we'll look, again an awful lot of information that is often quite hard to, 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 to process, but um, it just gives you huge insight into what's happening in the body during something like exercise. So one protein that we really uh, were excited to see in the exercise uh, um, effect was, uh, it's called decorin. And decorin is a really interesting molecule because it has quite oncosuppressive functions. Quite simply, it stops tumors from growing. So we have a very talented uh, young postdoc in our uh, group, uh, Dr. Marek Jort, who is looking to see if decorin 
is the molecular link between doing lots of exercise and the reduced risk of breast cancer. And that's something you can, uh, you can contact Marit. I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you about that research. Another really interesting thing that I didn't really pick up on in this research, but it sort of stuck with me for a while, was that a lot of these proteins that were changing with exercise have at some point been identified in something we call an exosome. So an exosome is a very, very small vesicle. So to give you an idea, it's about a 100 millionth of a meter in size. They are exceptionally small and they are released from cells. And the really cool thing about vesicles is that they can transfer messages, mRNAs that I mentioned earlier, and proteins between cells um, of, of one tissue and cells of the other tissue. So that kind of got me thinking, okay, well, if there are proteins that change with exercise in muscle that are in vesicles, maybe vesicle trafficking is a way in which the body can communicate during exercise. So, uh, as Mark kindly mentioned, we got this published in Cell Metabolism uh, just last month. Uh, we tried to get the, the cover here, um, so you can submit a cover to try and, uh, try and get it on, on the front there. Um, I don't think the ed editors got what I was getting at. I think they saw, uh, instead of seeing vesicle interchange with exercise, they saw a recently skinned human being <laughs> running away from a gun that shoots Maltesers. Um, however, it was great, as Mark mentioned, the New York Times picked this up. You can find this article on, online on the New York Times website. Gretchen did an incredible job of um, putting the article together after uh, she interviewed me. So um, if this means nothing to you, uh, I encourage you to go read the article. Uh, it's not fake news, as um, <laughs> our friend Donald might have you, uh, might have you think. So our approach here, we moved away from the muscle and into the circulation. So here we've got some individuals carrying out some exercise on a bike, and we took blood samples from them, and we analyzed their samples via the mass spectrometry analysis that I, I mentioned. So again, that gives you the quantity and identification of, in this case, 1,200 proteins in circulation. And what was immediately uh, obvious when we looked at these, these data was the number of proteins that were going up in circulation with exercise that make up these exosomes and, and small vesicles. So there are various protein classes that go up with exercise. All the proteins here that you can see are ones that change and go up with exercise. There was a huge enrichment of these that, that in this data set. So that gave us some really compelling data that when we exercise, we get a release of these very tiny vesicles that contain an awful lot of different proteins. Where do they go? That's the second question that we had. So in order to find that out, we uh, went back to our animal model. And uh, what we did here was transplant vesicles from the exercised mice into other recipients. And what we did there, before we made the transplantation, we labeled them with a uh, actually a biological tracker that fluoresces when we image them. And you can see that when we uh, interchange vesicles from the, the exercise mouse into the recipient, there's definitely a difference in the localization. So we get a really strong signal in this abdominal viscera here when we are uh, at the same time point. So that means that there's something intrinsic to the vesicles that makes them want to go to certain tissues. And uh, we've got extra data here to suggest that there's quite a strong uptake of these vehicle, vesicles within an hour of exercise into the liver. So what we think might be happening is when we exercise, we see release of vesicles. They're taken into the liver. A lot of metabolic enzymes are interchanged, and it's a way in which exercise can communicate uh, with uh, different tissues and, and try and upregulate either energy provision or some of the other things that we want to try and find out with further research. Um, as I've mentioned, we're a myokine group. So and if you think about when you exercise, it kind of makes sense that when you, when, you do, when you go for a run, it's the muscles that are doing all the work, right? That, 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 that's the organ that keeps, makes you move. That's what's doing all the hard work. So we want to ask, are vesicles released specifically from the muscle bed? 
Uh, and in order to do that, we did some really nice uh, sampling. So the data that I've shown you already was from the arterial circulation. And if we do the same analysis in the venous circulation, so here we've got cannulas in the femoral vein and the femoral artery. And what that allows us to do is see what proteins are going into the muscle and what proteins are going out of the muscle. So we get like a net flux or a net uptake or release of these proteins. And indeed, uh, if you look at this figure here, so if there's a protein on that line, it means it's neither being taken up or released. Uh, and just at the end of exercise, we see a large number of proteins that are released within vesicles from the muscle. So we can tick that box. We know that the muscle can secrete proteins in these tiny vesicles with exercise. And in particular, there's one protein here, integrin beta-5, uh, which actually is expressed on the surface of the vesicle. And we think that that's the protein that actually tells the vesicle to go to the liver. Okay, so we're getting a really insightful, uh, at the molecular level, uh, picture of what vesicles are, what they're carrying, and what, where they're going. And I think it's going to give us a, a beautiful framework to, to understand the biology of exercise in the future. So this is my, my summary. We see uh, a, a systemic release of, of vesicles with exercise. We know a lot of them are, are, are released, uh, proteins are released from the muscle when we exercise, and we certainly see a lot of uptake uh, into the liver. So going forward with this, again, we've got this framework. What we want to now see is, you know, where else do they go? What do they carry? And what functions do they do when they, they reach their destination? And just a few acknowledgements. Again, Mark Labos has been a fantastic mentor to me for nine years. Uh, all these other people have worked uh, in the lab with me. Uh, we've got, we got all our samples from a fantastic group in Copenhagen. I do all my mass spectrometry work over the University of Sydney, and we've got some great local uh, collaborators as well. It's been a fantastic effort from everyone. So, uh, and again, just uh, thank you all for coming, and um, thank you for your support.